so functions can either be odd or they can be even. They can also be neither. So it's either odd, even, or neither. They, they fall into three different categories. If something is odd, then it'll be reflected about the origin. You see the origin here? Mm -hmm. Whatever's in Q3 goes to Q1, or whatever's in Q1, uh, sorry, Q2, will go to Q4. Another example would be something like this. So it's reflected around the origin, zero, zero. Algebraically, you can denote an odd function. Something is odd. Let's say you have some function f of x to start off with. Something will be odd if f of negative x is equals to negative f of x. What does this even mean? So let's do a quick example. All it means is that the negative sign will come outside. Let's say f of x is x cubed. What is f of negative x? Negative x cubed. So it'll be negative x cubed like that. And then you can pull out the negative sign. It'll be negative x cubed. Now, x cubed was our original f of x, right? Mm -hmm. So you can rewrite this as negative original f of x. So now look at the relationship. f of negative x is equals to negative f of x. This is the condition for odd. Therefore, x cubed is an odd function, OK? Mm -hmm. Another example of this is slightly more difficult. It's this. Let's say f of x is sine of x. What is f of negative x? It'll be sine of negative x, right? Like that? Mm -hmm. Now think about it. Let's say you have some angle x. We're going to assume it's acute angle. This is angle x. But if you go below the x-axis, then your angle becomes negative, right? This angle mm -hmm. is negative x. Now, if you use the cast rule in quadrant four, is sine positive or negative? C is cosine. That means only cosine is positive, or it's reciprocal secant. Sine will be negative in quadrant four. So f of negative x is negative sine of x. And now you can write sine of x as the original f of x. Therefore, f of negative x is the exact same thing as negative f of x. And that is our condition for an odd function. Therefore, this function is odd as well. Cool? Mm -hmm. If you want a numerical example here for this one, let's say you have 45 degrees. Sine of 45 is, you can get this from the special 45, 45, 90 triangle. It's 1 over root 2. Now, on the, in the same vein, let's say you're trying to find sine of negative 45. So if we're going down this way, it's negative 45. But if we go our usual way, that's going to be 315. So sine of negative 45 is the exact same thing as sine of 315 if you want positive angles. Now, what does Castrol say? Castrol says you can write any uh, obtuse or reflex angle in terms of its acute angle. So here, sine 315 is the exact same thing as sine of 45 because our alpha, our acute angle, is 45 degrees. Except we're in quadrant 4. Therefore, sign is negative. So you see that negative sign? It comes out. That's the idea. What about even functions? Even functions are something that are like um, something like this. It's going to be perfectly reflected on the y-axis, like this. Perfectly reflected on the y-axis.
cosine x as an example of this. Cosine x looks like this. Algebraically, an even function is f of x. Oh, sorry, it's always going to be f of negative x. It's the same. The initial condition is the same. f of negative x. But for an even function, that negative sign completely disappears. Here, let's do some examples. Let's say f of x is x squared. What's f of negative x? It's just x squared. It's just x squared. It's the original thing. And f of negative x is equals to f of x. Therefore, x squared is an even function. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you do the same thing we did with sine, uh, with the cosine x now, f of x is cosine x. f of negative x will be cosine of negative x. Now look at this. Is cosine positive or negative in quadrant four? Positive. Positive. That means this negative x becomes a positive x. It has no impact. In other words, cos of negative 45 is the exact same thing as cos of positive 45, because negative 45 would put you in quadrant four where cosine is positive. So that negative sign completely disappears. So f of negative x would be f of x. Cool? Mm -hmm. So this is the idea between odd function and an even function. Do not confuse this with odd degree function. Odd degree and even degree only applies to polynomials. Like x to the 7 is an odd degree function. It is also um, an odd function. But x to the power of 7 plus 5 or something, this is an odd degree function. But if you go and use our rule earlier, you're not going to get negative f of x. This is not an odd function. So that's the distinction. Odd degree and even degree only applies to polynomials. Just because something is an odd degree doesn't automatically make it an odd function, okay? Mm -hmm. Like here, let's, let's just do this. f of x is x7 plus 5. What's f of negative x? All you have to do is replace that x with what you have in the bracket. With the, in this case, it will be negative x. All you have to do is replace this x with what you have in the bracket. So it'll be negative x7 plus 5. Negative 1 to the power of 7 is negative. x7 plus 5. Now here's the question for you. Is this equals to negative f of x? Or this is your f of x, or your original function? If we multiply this expression by negative 1, are we going to get f of x? And the answer is no, right? Look at this. Negative x plus 5 times negative 1. Negative x7 times negative 1 is positive x7. Positive 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. And it's not the same thing as negative f of x. OK? Mm -hmm. If you multiply this with negative 1, you should get this if it's an odd function. This one is neither. Even though it is an odd degree function, it is not an odd function. So that's kind of like the idea. Um, now let's go into something called combining functions. I'm going to start off with an easy one here. So we're given a quadratic that's opened upside down, and we're given a linear function that has a negative slope. One of them is f of x. The other one is g of x. So we have two different functions here. Our goal is to combine these two. We can combine them by either adding them up or subtracting them, OK? It depends on what the question's asking you for. You can either add them up to combine them, or you can subtract them to combine them. So how does this even work? So let me show you this from a graphical perspective. It's pretty simple, actually. What you do is the x values are always going to stay the same. 
x values never change. It's the independent variable. The only thing that changes is the y values. Check this out. For x value of 2, right? Mm -hmm. What's the y value of the blue curve? Which is f of x. What's the y value when the x value is 2? For the blue curve. It is negative 1. It's negative 1. Right? Yeah. It's negative 1. Uh, g of x. So when x is 2, f of x is negative 1. What about g of x? What's the value of the red curve? Looks like it's, it's negative, negative four. It's negative 4. Now look at this. If you want to add them up, you can either denote this as f minus g of x, or the way they've done it, f of x Oh, sorry, if you want to add them up, f of x plus g of x. So the x value is going to stay exactly the same, but the y value, we're going to add these two numbers, negative 1 plus negative 4. What's negative 1 plus negative 4? Negative 5. Negative 5. So the combined function, if you add them up, okay, when the x value is 2, the y value will be negative 5. There we go. We have our first point. What about when the x value is negative 1? Again, we don't have to write it out, but when the x value is negative 1, the blue curve has a y value of 2. The red curve has a y value of negative 2. So 2 plus negative 2 is 0. So if you add them up, the combined function at 1, oh, sorry, this was meant to be 1, the y value is 0. OK? Mm -hmm. What about when the x value is 0? What's the y value of the combined function? Or we can do it like this. So when the x value is 0, the blue curve, f of x, the y value is 3, yeah? Mm -hmm. The red curve, what's the y value when x is 0? It's zero. That's zero. So three minus zero is three. So when the x value is zero, the y value is still three, like that. Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. When the x value is negative one, again, the chart, you don't really have to do this. This is just because we're showing it for the first time. Eventually, we'll just be adding it on the curve itself. But when the x value is negative one, the blue curve looks like it's two. The red curve is also two. That means the combined function is going to be a four. Like that. When the x value is negative 2, it is going to be negative 1 plus 4. It'll be 3, right? When the x value is 3, and now this is negative 7 plus 6, it's going to be at like negative 1 like that. So now we have a nice little pattern here. We're just going to combine them. So this red curve, sorry, this black curve is f of x plus g of x, the combined function. Cool? Mm -hmm. Now this is doing it graphically, right? This is doing it graphically. What if we wanted to do this algebraically? It's it's very simple. It's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing we just did, but we're just going to add up x's. So if you want to do this algebraically, all you do is you take your f of x, and then you add it with your g of x. f of x is negative x squared plus 3. g of x is negative 2x. If you combine this, you're going to get negative x squared minus 2x plus 3. And this is the equation for this black curve. This is doing it algebraically. We could man this, find the x-intercepts which would have been negative 3 and positive 1. We know the y-intercept is 3, right? Mm -hmm. And we can find the midpoint that is going to be at negative 1, and the y-value there will be 4. So this is the curve for f of x plus g of x, the algebraic approach, or you can add them on the graph. Similarly, you can subtract them as well, OK? Here we added them. 
but you could do the exact same thing you could do maybe we'll do it in the next problem we will do like if we want to so we're focused on one specific point let's say at two when x is two f of x was um negative one and g of x was negative four. If you subtract them, negative one minus negative four, that'll give you positive three. So at two, we will get this as our point if you were to subtract them. And then you just find the other points and you connect the dots. And that'll give you the expression for f minus g or f of x minus g of x. Okay, this one is slightly more trickier. Have they given us a curve? All right, they've given us a curve. So let's use this. From these curves, okay, what's the domain of the blue function 10 to the power of x? Domain means the possible x values it can take. It's the same thing as a polynomial function. Exponential function, 10 to the power of x, has the same domain as a polynomial function. Can it be 10? Can x be 10? Yes. Can it be a million? Is there anything it cannot be? No. So is there any restriction on the domain? There isn't. There isn't. So X E R. X can be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. What about the range? Is there a restriction? And the answer is yes. Can y ever be zero? No. No, so it means that the restriction is y has to be greater than zero, okay, like that. Mm -hmm. Now look at the log of x. It may seem tricky, but it's really not that tricky. Is there any restrictions on the x? Can x be negative 6? Look at the curve. Or you can look at mm -hmm. the axes. No, it cannot. So what's the restriction? x can't be more than negative 4. Uh, x has to be bigger than negative 5. OK? You see that asymptote mm -hmm. there? Is that negative 5? x cannot be anything less than negative. So x has to be strictly bigger than negative 5. What about the y values? Does that have a restriction? No. Nope. y is going to be y, e, r. OK, like that. Now, when we're adding these, let's just add some of these up. Let's see what that gives us. 0 plus 0 is a 0. So you see this point mm -hmm. is going to be approximately right there. Um, what is this? 1 plus 1 is going to be like 2.8. 1, OK, we don't even have that point. So the only points we have is like this. And it's, it's going to grow something like this. Now, the most important part here is the combined function, f plus x or f minus x. Are we ever going to get any points over here beyond negative 5? No. No, we are not, OK? Because only one of the functions exists. So you have f plus g 
um, the first one, 10 to the power of x, exists everywhere. But g only exists when it's bigger than negative 5. That means when you go to combine them, you're adding something that doesn't exist beyond negative 5 with something that does exist. This doesn't work out. So there is a restriction for f plus g. And the restriction is that the combined function, the domain, is also going to be the one that's restricted, like this. Because only one function exists beyond negative six. So if you go beyond negative five, so if you combine them, then the combined function is only going to exist where both of them originally existed. OK? Mm -hmm. Because of this restriction. So it's basically going to do the lowest common denominator kind of a thing, or the lowest common domain, the smaller of the two domains. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. the smaller of the two domains. So that's the idea here. The domain of the function is going to be x is bigger than negative 5. Anything else here? Um, you're using a word called intersection. Let me show you what this is. We're going to use a number line. Let's say I'm going from negative 5 with a closed circle to 1 with an open circle. On the other hand, which means the domain of this is negative x inclusive and 1 is exclusive. On the other hand, I'm going from negative infinity to positive infinity on the other guy. So that's the domain, negative infinity to positive infinity. Infinities are never inclusive. What's the combined domain? Let's say this is f, this is g. What would be the combined domain? And the answer is, it's going to be this one, the combined one, right? Because this function doesn't exist beyond these. So when you add nothing with something, you can't do that because it doesn't exist. You're not adding a zero. Just because this doesn't exist here doesn't make this a zero, OK? It just simply does not exist. The value there is not zero. It simply doesn't exist. And you can't add something that doesn't exist with something that does. So the combined domain, if you have both of these, will be this one. You can make this a little bit more complicated. Let's say I'm going from negative 2 to positive 2. Both of them are inclusive. On the other hand, for the other guy, I'm going from negative 5 to 0. This one is exclusive. This one is inclusive. I'll write this down. So you have something like this, and you have something like this. This is f. This is g. What's the domain of f plus g? And remember, they both have to exist at those x values. What do you think? What will be the domain of f plus g? And the answer is this. The lower limit, OK? The mm -hmm. lower limit of the combined function is going to be negative 2, because the first one doesn't exist beyond negative 2. So it doesn't matter if you're adding them, subtracting them. The lower limit is going to be negative 2 inclusive because this negative 2 is included. What about the upper limit? Zero. Is zero included or no? Inclusive or exclusive? Exclusive. Exclusive, exactly. So there you go. That, that would be the domain. Negative 2 is included, but zero is not. Cool? Mm-hmm. So whenever you're adding two different functions, the domain of the final function is going to be where they both intersect. That's the idea. Like in the first example that we did, negative 5 to 5, whatever it was, and we went from negative infinity to positive infinity, their intersection is this bit right here. So that would be the domain, which ended up being the lower of the two. But you got to look for where they intersect.
Here, let's try doing some of these. Um, so sometimes they will give you a curve or a coordinate system, a plane, whatever axes. So you can just add the Y values up for on the sketch on the graph itself. But sometimes they will give you point of coordinates like this. And it's going to ask you to do the same thing, except now we don't have a curve. And the difference between this and the last, uh, if you have a curve, is a curve exists on all the x values. It's going to exist at 1, 1.01, 1 1.001, yada, yada, yada. That's for a curve. But when they give you a point values like these, like coordinate systems, these functions only exist at a point in time. There's nothing that's linking these two points, OK? If they give you something like this, that means your graph would look something like this. They're not going to connect. Whereas if they give you a graph, then it probably connects everywhere. So what does this change? Remember, the function's only going to exist where they both have or where their domain intersects. Look at these two functions. For f, you have a negative 4. So f exists when x is negative 4. So does g, right? So f plus g is valid at negative 4 because they both exist over there. Same thing with negative 2. But look at this. This one exists on 1, which they've shared. But this guy only exists at 0. So is 0 in the domain of f plus g? No. No, it's not. So what you do with these, if they give you a coordinate system, is that the x values that they don't have in common, you scratch the entire coordinate out. That's not going to take part in the calculations. So this entire thing, you can literally delete it. What about 2? Can we delete 2? This point. Yes. Yeah, 2 is gone as well. What about the 3 that's above it. Can we delete this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now four they both have in common. So from here it's just an elementary school adding up. So for a f plus g again we're just going to use the proper notation like they have. The x values are going to stay exactly the same. So negative four negative four x values always stay the same. But now the y values because you're doing f plus g you got to add them up. So it'll be negative four comma six. That's our first point. Our second point, negative two, is going to stay the same, four plus one, five. The next point, one is going to stay the same, five. The next point, eight is going to stay the same, it's not eight, sorry. Don't add the x values, it's a very common mistake. The x value is going to stay the same, it's going to be 10. There you go, that's f plus g. f minus g will look very, very similar. All the x values that they have in common are going to repeat. But now instead of um, adding the y values, you're going to subtract them. So what's the four, first coordinate? Negative 4 and 1, if you're subtracting them. 2. 2. The next one would be 4 minus 1, 3. The next one is 3 minus 1, 2 or the other way around, 3 minus 2, 1, and the last one is 6 minus 4, 2. You can do this with the same function repeating. Now look at E, E is a little bit tricky. F plus F has nothing to do with the G function, okay? F plus F. So you're adding F with itself. Does it have any restrictions in terms of the X values, in terms of those five X values? No, because f is going to exist where the original f existed. So all the x values are going to be relevant. And for the y values, you just add them up. So negative 4 and 8, just add this with itself, basically. Negative 2 and 8 as well. 1 and what? What's the y value of 1? 6. 6. 3 will be 10, and then 4 will be 12, like that. There we go. That's f plus f. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. 
So when you're adding the coordinates, it's going to exist where they are both sharing the x values. Everything else, it's not going to exist. x squared minus 3 looks something like this. And the other curve is going to look 2. When x is 0, it's 3. And the other curve is going to look like this. So this is g of x, this is f of x. What's the domain of f of x? It's a polynomial function, it's a quadratic. What's the domain? Remember, polynomial functions don't have any restrictions. So what would be its domain? Negative infinity to positive infinity. Yeah, exactly. If you want the interval system, you'd write it like this with um, rounded brackets because infinity is never included. If you want it in terms of sets, then you would write x is an element of all real numbers, OK? Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that with the r, I put down an extra one. And it means it's it's part of the real number system. There's a difference between R. I guess it doesn't really matter, but this is how you would write it. This means a bolded, bolded R when you're writing it by hand. What does that even, what does that mean though? Um, I don't know how to explain it. Let me, let me try. Um, you know how in biology or something, you have scientific names, yeah? Like you have, if you if you open a book or if you see it printed out, you would see it written in italics, Homo sapiens. Um, the genus is capitalized. Genus means this, but the species is not capitalized. Okay, so mm -hmm. it'll be written like this, and it'll be in italics. Maybe I'm not doing a very good job here, but this will be cursive. It'll be italics. This is how you'd see it printed. But when you're writing it by hand on a piece of paper, then you need to underline it. When you underline it, it means it's italicized. So that's the same idea with this R here. If you see it printed on a book, it's going to be bold. The X will be normal, E will be normal, the R will be bold. But when you're writing it by hand, this is the proper way to do it with like double lines on the R. So that's just a little bit of a tangent thing. Not a super big deal. Anyways, let's look at the other curve, G of X. What's the domain here? Does it have any restrictions? Yes. Correcto. So where is the restriction? What can x not be? 2. 2. Can x be anything else except 2? Yes. Correct. So the restriction, you can write it like this. Negative inf OK, that's a terrible infinity. Negative infinity to positive 2. It cannot be positive 2. That's why there's a rounded bracket. 2 is exclusive. If x were to be 2, you'd be dividing by 0, which is undefined. Union, positive 2 to positive infinity. So that's the domain in interval notation. If you want it in set notation, it would look like this. x is an element of all real numbers, OK? Semicolon, mm -hmm. x cannot be 2. That's how you'd write it in a set notation. You saw these curly brackets earlier when we were doing this. 
these are set notations. Okay. Mm -hmm. that. Can you draw these? I always mm -hmm. have trouble with this, this one. The one that's like, yeah. Anyways, that's how you do it. So now, what's the answer to part B? For which value of x in the combined function is f plus g undefined? So what value can f plus g not take? When x is 2? Yes, so that's the answer to B. It's because g of x doesn't exist when x is 2, yeah? That's that's the reason for this. I don't think we answered part, part 1 correctly. It says determine f plus g 4. Okay, it's not a too big of a deal. f plus g at 4 means f of 4 plus g of 4. You take their individual y values when the x value is 4 and add them up. For the first one, f of 4 would be 4 squared minus 3. That's 16 minus 3. That's 13. And g of 4 would be negative 6 over 4 minus 2. That's negative 6 over 2. That'll be negative 3. Therefore, f plus g of 4 is positive 10. Okay? What that means is if you were to overlay these two together, if you were to combine them, then at 2, there's an asymptote you would have something like this and something like this. When the x value is 4, the y value will be 10 for the combined function somewhere. That's what this means. Part C, what is the domain of f plus gx and f minus gx? What do you think the domain is? And remember, the domain is where the, both the functions are valid. Or if you want a number line approach, we can get rid of these sketches. You want to see where the domains intersect. So the first one goes from negative infinity to infinity all the way through the number line. The other one does something very similar, except it's going to take a break at positive 2. So what's the intersection between these two? I'll give you a hint. If one of them is XER, then it's going to be the lower of the two domains, or the more restricted domain, if one of them is XER. Because the first one's valid everywhere. So it's like this, you don't even have to take this into account. Where they both intersect is at the lowest common domain, which will be this one. Because this has this covered, right? Negative infinity to positive infinity. So mm -hmm. you can take that completely out of the equation. It'll be this. This will be the combined domain when you're adding them and when you're subtracting them. It's valid everywhere, everywhere except when the x value is positive too, because g is not valid there. What's the domain of this? I'll give you a sketch. Looks like this. How did I know that that's what the sketch looks like? It's because I know square root of x looks like this, starts at 0, 0. And the, this plus 1, all this does is this is a transformation. The d value is negative 1, which means it's going to shift one unit to the left. This is what f of x looks like. What's the domain of this? You can just look at the sketch. What are the possible x values this function can take? Anything more than negative 1? Can it take the value of exactly negative 1? Yes. Yes. So the domain is um, negative 1 inclusive to positive infinity. The other one is going to be tricky to graph. I'm going to try, though. 
the two doesn't really affect anything. It's a vertical stretch. It's not going to affect any critical points. Log of x looks like this, OK? Log base mm -hmm. 10. If there's no base, the base is 10. What does this minus sign do? That's the k value. k is negative 1. What do you think that does? It's a reflection on the y-axis. So that negative 1 is going to shift it this way. This is the graph of log of negative x, OK? Mm -hmm. You see this plus 1? Uh -huh. Is it going to take it left or right? Left. It's going to take it left. That's complete. That's right. So at negative 1, OK, the final sketch, there's going to be a vertical asymptote at negative 1 like this. This is at negative 1. And our function is only going to exist over here. Look at the graph. What's the domain? X is greater than negative 1. Greater or smaller? Greater means 0, 1, 2, oh, 3, smaller. smaller. So the domain here is negative infinity to negative 1. And it cannot be negative 1 because there's an asymptote. Now let's see where they intersect. The first one is going from negative infinity to negative 1, open circle. The other guy is going from negative 1 with a closed circle all the way to infinity, positive infinity. Where do they intersect? Will f plus g, or f minus g, doesn't matter. Will this combined function, I think this is the biggest question, will this combined function be valid when x is negative 1? This is the big question here. No, it won't be valid because there's a vertical asymptote there, right? You mm -hmm. you'll be trying to add a vertical asymptote with the other curve, so it's not valid over here. So, do they intersect anywhere? They don't. They don't. So this function simply will cease to exist. Okay, let's try it. Mm -hmm because visualizing things is always, always helpful, I find. Because what are we actually doing, right? That's, that's always the point. What are we actually doing? So these are our two curves. We already knew this, right? That's what it looks mm -hmm. like. But now if you go this, f minus g, look at that. It's a green curve. It just doesn't exist anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it exist? If the question was like, why doesn't it exist? It has something to do with this thing that we just talked about. Because their domain, right, never intersect. For the combined function to be valid, their domain has to intersect somewhere. In this case, the domain just does not intersect anywhere. So the combined function simply does not exist. It's not zero. It just doesn't exist. OK? Mm -hmm. Zero exists. It's weird. Zero is nothing, but it at, at least exists. Like how many, I don't know, how many planes do I own? Zero, right? That's valid. But like how big is the universe? We don't know. That's invalid. That just we don't know how much it is. So the answer to that does not exist. Um, let's try this one. This looks fun. Given the function, the absolute value of x, by the way, absolute value of x is extremely similar to x squared. They both are going to either open up or down. They both have a vertex. They both go through the origin. 
So I think they want us to I can just graph this one. This one's very simple to graph. So absolute value of x looks like this. It goes through 0, 0, goes through 1, 1, goes through 2, 2. And we'll look something like this. And it's going to do the same thing. It looks like a v. It's going to do the same thing across the x-axis. So it's going to pass through all these points. That's the absolute value of x, f of x. g of x equals to x. We all know what that looks like. looks like this. It's just a straight line that goes through the origin. So this is g of x equals x. Now they've, they've asked us to add them up, yeah? Mm -hmm. And look at this. For the x value of 1, f of x is, what's the y value of f of x? When the x value is 1, if f of x is the absolute value of x, what's the y value? What's the absolute mm -hmm. value of 1? Yeah, it's just 1. So when x is 1, y is 1. When x is 2, y is 2. When x is 3, y is 3. What about when x is negative 1? What's the y value? For f of x. What's the absolute value of negative 1? It's 1. Correct. Negative 2 would be 2. Negative 3 would be 3. Yeah, you see that pattern? It's always mm -hmm. going to spit out a positive value. But as g of x equals x, it's just going to take whatever the x value is. So if x is 1, like that. It just takes whatever the x value is. You can see that from the graph as well. Now, what's f plus g? When the x value is 1, what's f plus g? the combined function. It's 1. It's 2, right? f plus g. 1 plus 1. When the x value is 1, they both have a y value of 1. That means the combined function will have a y value of 2. Yeah? Mm -hmm. When the x value is 2, both functions have 2 and 2. So 2 plus 2 is 4. Three, now the next point is going to be 3 plus 3 is 6. So 3, 4, 5, 6. 4, 5, 6, 7. It's just going to double, okay, like that. It's just going to double. So on the right of the origin, this is what it looks like if I drew it right. Something like that. What about to the left of origin? When x is negative 1, what's the y value for the combined function? Negative 2. Well, add them up. What's 1 plus negative 1? 0, yeah? It's 0. 0. So when x is negative 1, y is 0. What about when x is negative 2? What's the combined value for y? It's 0. It's 0. 3, 0. 4, you can see the pattern here, yeah? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, what your curve f plus g would look like is something like this. It's going to be 0 all the way throughout until the origin. And then from there, it's going to spike up like this. OK? Mm -hmm. Is that odd, even, or neither? So you have something like, like this. You have this function till the origin, and from here, it spikes up. Is this function odd, even, or neither is the question? Is this symmetrical around the y-axis? Which means if you put a mirror here, yeah? Mm -hmm. Whatever's on the right should be on the left. Is that the case? No. No. You would expect to have something like this, right? You'd expect to see something like this, but you won't if you put a mirror there. So it is not an even function. What about an odd function?
we can prove this algebraically. So your, let's call it h of x or whatever. h of x is f plus g. So your h of x, your final function is the absolute value of x plus x, OK? That's your h of x. Mm -hmm. What's h of negative x? If this is h of x, what's h of negative x? You're just going to replace wherever you see an x with a mm -hmm. negative x. Mm -hmm. So you will get negative x plus negative x. What's the absolute value of negative x? It's always going to spit out a positive number, right? So the negative mm -hmm. sign there is going to make no difference. But it is going to make a difference here, OK, like that. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, if it's an even function, f of negative x is equals to f of x. If you put a negative in there, it'll spit out the original function. Is this and this the same? No. No, it's not. So it's not even. We knew that from the sketch. For an odd function, right? the negative sign will come out. In other words, if you multiply this by negative 1, you will get this. Is that the case? No. No, it's not. So is it odd or even? It's neither. Correct. So there you go. So we're given f, we're given g. What's the restriction for f? Remember, it's a reciprocal function, it's a rational function, whatever. There's always going to be restrictions. What is the restriction here for the first function, f of x? Remember, it can't have 0 in the denominator. So there is some value of x, which will give you a 0 in the denominator. What value of x would make the entire denominator a 0? No? You'll just solve it like this in your head. What's x? Negative 4 over 3. Right. So if x were to be negative 4 over 3, you'd get a 0 in the denominator, right? Mm -hmm. So for f, the domain is that x can be everything except x cannot be negative 4 over 3. What about for g? What's the domain for g? What can x not be? 2. 2. So x can be everything except x cannot be positive 2. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now see if you can find the intersection. The first one looks like this. The second one looks like this, where there's a positive infinity on the right for both and negative infinity on the left for both. Where do they intersect? Everywhere except where? 2 and negative 4 over 3. Right, so that's going to be the domain of f plus g, right? Look at this. It's going to exist everywhere from negative infinity, but now it's going to take a break at negative 4 over 3. And then it's going to ex exist everywhere at negative 4 over 3 onwards up until it hits a 2, right? Mm -hmm. And from 2 all the way to positive infinity. So it's divided into three different areas. So the combined domain would be that x can be everything, except it cannot be negative 4 over 3 or 2, OK? Like that. Mm -hmm. Part C, what's the value of f plus g at 8? Super simple question for C. f plus g at 8 is just f of 8 plus g of 8. To find f of 8, you just replace that x in the denominator with an 8 plus 4. To find g of 8, 
you will just replace that x with an 8 like that, okay? Mm -hmm. So this value is 1 over 28. Quick maths, yeah. 1 over 6. What's the common denominator between 28 and 6? It's um, 54, just double it. Try it. six doesn't go into 28, that's fine. But then you wanna double the bigger number and see if six goes into that. And six does go into 54, yeah? So it'll be 54, this times two. And six times what is 54? Nine. So you have 11 over 54, that's the answer for plus. And if you wanna subtract them, it'll be two well, the only difference will be that this will be minus. So it'll be 2 minus 9 over 54. That's negative 7 over 54. This is the answer to part D. And when we added them up, that's the answer to part C. And there we go. We are done with the question. Cool? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. You're just adding individual numbers, okay? And once you know the idea, it's just it's whatever. The domain is a little bit confusing, but if you know your functions... It's not too difficult. All right, let's let's call it a day there for today. Okay, thank you. See ya.